Hello, welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to be reading a scary story called Button Head. This story was suggested by Archimis Arrow. Thank you Archimis Arrow for the suggestion. I appreciate it greatly. And for anybody else, if you have any suggestions for SCPs or creepypastas, let me know in the comments down below. If I read your story, I will give you a shout out. Again, thank you Archimis Arrow for the suggestion. Also, I recently created a Discord. There you can uh, give me suggestions for creepypastas or even uh, discuss different creepypastas or SCPs. I'll be putting a link in the description below so you can check it out. The name of the Discord is I Read Pasta, the same as my YouTube channel. So, without any further ado, let's get right into the story. Back in the late 80s, I worked for, the, for a US Department of Energy laboratory in the American Southwest. A set of sprawling cities within cities. The DOE lab complex employs thousands of people with work ranging from computer science, physics and chemistry, all the way to important infrastructure jobs like construction or security. I worked on mainframes at the time. Like any secure government facilities, this particular complex had a set of colorful local legends that over-dramatized the mysterious work we performed. People were convinced that the labs held evidence that aliens had visited us in the 50s, or that we developed a neutron bomb capable of wiping out cities without destroying any buildings, or that we were sitting on cold fusion technology but were keeping it a secret to protect the interests of big oil. These are all completely false. In reality, the labs were run much like any other company. We had time cards, deadlines, department meetings, and boss day lunches. Just like anybody else, despite or perhaps because of the reality of mundane lab work, staff often got a kick out of perpetuating these myths. While on a lunch break, I was once asked if I'd ever been to the flying saucer hangar. Which one? I replied. We've got our own fleet. More interesting and often much more dark were the stories that circulated between scientists and lab staff within the walls of the complex. One such rumor hoisted that physicists had briefly made contact with humans from a distant future, and that the transmission was IBD. Interesting, but disturbing. Another popular rumor held that we'd created a biological agent so virulent that the labs had been forced to quarantine an entire building, raise it to the ground, and bury the rubble in the desert, along with its deceased inhabitants. My favorite story though, Buttonhead is watching me. And these days, the halls of every building were plastered with information, security, awareness posters, usually featuring a red-faced villain wearing a trench coat. Beware of your adversary. Protect your secrets. The enemy is always watching. Always dispose of sensitive documents in a burn bag. It's likely that Buttonhead was a mishmash of popular alien myths and a pervasive atmosphere of the Cold War paranoia and embodied the idea of an inside threat. The Buttonhead legend went something like this. When working late at night, be on the watch for Buttonhead. He prowls the laboratory halls after sundown. He can only get you when you're alone. He doesn't have a mouth to speak or ears to hear, but he has eyes that do more than see, and he's always watching. According to the witness, Bunhead looked like a person from a far away, but had a featureless roundish head with a pair of deep holes in the center of his face. Nobody ever said what Bunhead was watching for or what he would do if he ever caught you alone. It was typically the older lab veterans who would bring up Bunhead along with hushed stories about mysterious disappearances of several Night Owl employees over the years. During a retirement party, I jokingly asked the guest of honor if he had ever seen Buttonhead. I saw it once in one of my old warehouses 
way south of the tech area, he replied, cracking a forced smile. I remember the smell, most of all. So is he an alien or just a regular old ghost? The smile quickly drained away. He paused it, looking like he might confess something important, but stopped it short of it, muttering, Uh, no. It's much worse than that. A few months later, I was pulling a late night in one of our mainframe rooms, performing some maintenance work with a co-worker, a contractor named Gary. Gary, a bald, pudgy, diabetic Mormon, was a salt-of-the-earth type with an easygoing demeanor. He had an abbreviated sense of humor, but he didn't have a mean bone in his body and was a good colleague. The mainframe rooms was in the largest single-story building in the complex, with around 20 crisscrossing halls that seemed to stretch on to infinity. After working hours, most of these halls would fall pitch black. Hall D, or mainframe hall, was still lit, but every other hall was a catacomb tunnel, with only the faint glow of the occasional vending machine to illuminate the far away corners of the building. The mainframe computer room itself was large, but was stuffed with IBM system 370s and noisy, fridge-sized cooling units. It wasn't feng shui or anything, but we loved playing around with computers so much that we didn't mind. At around 9 or 10 that night, Gary left the room for a bio break, leaving me alone at my terminal. 30 minutes later, the light flickered off. This was a frequent occurrence in the aging building, which was why we armed ourselves with flashlights for the late shift. I noticed that Gary hadn't returned from the men's room, so as I felt the call of nature myself, I grabbed my ever ready and headed out the door to check things out. That's when I first noticed the smell. I tell folks that it smelled like mint gum and roach poison. But there was an indescribable and subtle sickness to it. I've never smelled anything like it since. It was the scent of something horribly unclean and unnatural combined with a potent artificial sweetness. I left the mainframe room and hurried towards the men's room which was two darkened hallways over. I made it five paces when I saw him. Or it or whatever it was, standing in front of the exit doors at the far end of Hall D was what looked like a man wearing a grey jumpsuit. Both it and I remained motionless. As I trained my light down the hall, seconds later it broke into a speed walk straight for me. I was still a few hundred feet away but I could tell something was clearly wrong by the way it walked. It had an impossibly fast gait, like people from the old news reel clips, and by its head, which looked like an enlarged, lumpy orb. When its face came into view, I sprinted back into the mainframe room, which thankfully had a mechanical push button lock. Its face was utterly unrecognizable. It was just a scattered set of abscess and holes. After slamming the door shut and backing towards the desk, a figure appeared in the small frosted safety window. It was quiet for a moment, and then it spoke. It's Gary. Let me in. I just saw something. I couldn't hear it perfectly over the drone of the fans, but something wasn't right about the voice. It sounded like Gary, but as if it was leading some sort of spoken word chant with dozens of other voices. It instantly drawn on me that Gary knew the lock combination. I was paralyzed with fear and didn't respond. At this point, the smell was so strong that it almost hurt to breathe. It spoke again. It's Gary. Let me in. I just saw something. It sounded like an identical recording of what I'd heard seconds ago. My heart sunk when I realized that there weren't any other exits to the room. 
I backed up towards the machines, quietly hoping that the thing would go away and that the lights would come back on. A deep buzzing sound came from the other side of the door, followed by more words from that thing in the hall. Hello? Honey? The voice had a muffled pitch over the telephone receiver, but it was clearly my wife. It sounded like she was at home. Hun, is that you? Is everything okay? I was in a state of confusion, despair and shock. I summoned the courage to approach the door, aiming my light through the window. The police have been notified, I yelled. It was impossible though, as the mainframe room wasn't technically an office space and thus had no phone. I heard something that sounded like liquid being pulled up through a novelty straw and then a splattering sound. A thick white fluid slowly spilled out onto the vinyl tiled from underneath the door. The smell was nearly unbearable. I began yelping for help. I could hear the thing fumbling with the push button lock. The splattering continued and the dense white syrup kept pouring in from beneath the door. I remember retreating to the back corner of the mainframe room and then nothing else. Hours later, a pair of MPs found me curled up in a ball, soaping wet in the rear corner of the mainframe room. My wife, who had received a call at 10.30 from someone she believed to be me, called the base police at midnight after I didn't return home. The guards didn't find any signs of forced entry and there were no signs of Gary or the white liquid. The next morning, my manager told me that Gary had terminated his contract earlier that week and wasn't ever scheduled to come in that day. I never saw him again. My wife and I moved to California a month later. Even though I work from home these days, my pulse still quickens when I walk down the darkened hallway. What stays with me the most is that strange awful smell. It's probably just my brain playing tricks on me, but I swear it still rafts in through the windows some nights. <laughs>